Introducing health and wellness advocate, veteran international real estate investment expert, author and speaker, Adiel Gurel. Health tips, fitness tips, nutrition and well-being, world-class experts, all right here on my podcast, The Adiel Gurel Show. We had a guest on the show, the, uh, you know, Urban Monk. And I asked him the question, which I'm asking you now too. I had a hundred experiences happen to me, a hundred exactly, for this example. 99 of them, for this example, I'm a very, very lucky guy in this, in this example. 99 of them were great, wonderful experiences. One of them sucked. Why is it that like a magnet, I hark back to the one and not to the 99? It's a 1.0 default operating system problem for all of us, myself included. Uh, It's called the negativity bias and it's the bad is stronger than good in the brain. So when something bad happens to you, your brain doesn't pay like a little bit more attention to it, pays a ton more attention to it. It'll obsess about it, um, ruminate about it. It'll go over and over and over and over that thing, that one thing when 99% was good or positive. Uh, it's the root of our collective discontent, actually. Um, and, and to override, again, thinking neuroplasticity here, right? To, to change, so, so basically, you, you, I'm going to use your language with the Teflon and, and I'm going to add Velcro. Um, vel- negativity is like Velcro for the brain and positivity is like Teflon for the brain. It just slips right through. Positive, you, have, you watch a beautiful sunset or you have a lovely conversation with your significant other or you, you know, whatever it is, and it doesn't stick the same way that negativity tends to stick. Uh, you don't have to do a lot for negative information to kind of get in there and really lodge itself. So the question is, becomes naturally from a brain hacking or rewiring perspective, how do you flip those? How do you, how do you make positive information like Velcro for the brain and negative information like Teflon. It's a Herculean shift. It's a big shift. It really hurts when people are critical, you know? And, and so, um, but there's a few, few cute uh, kind of uh, tips or, or, or tools here. One, one is um, savoring. So this is research by Rick Hansen at UC Berkeley. And what he's found and, and is, a, is a strong advocate of is taking at least 10 seconds to savor positive things when they happen to you. So I've got a seven-year-old and an eight-month-old. So I've got all these little moments in my day with little people that are just beautiful. You know, like when I, you know, my, my, my little boy is crawling all over the place right now. And, and, and he's just, he's, you know, both of them are obsessed with mastery. Like everything is about learning and trying this new thing and, you know, in, in totally different ways. But like, there's so much to celebrate. There's just so much to celebrate. But life is also stressful. And, and there's a lot on my plate and I've got a lot going on. And like, I, I have a choice every day. And I know this, this sounds uh, almost cliche, right? But, but there is the moment the, the, the moment of choice and the rewiring happening really is in these micro moments. So if my boy, and again, he's not walking yet, but he's crawling. So if he pulls himself up on the couch and like stands up by himself, which he's now doing occasionally, if I celebrate with them and kind of get down on his level and we kind of do this little thing, um, that would be an example of savoring. But if I'm, got my eye on the dishes because we just finished dinner and I'm the dish guy in our family. Right. And I've got to like do the, you know, this task orientation. Um, it's, you know, chat, chat actually often will describe it as human doings versus human, human beings. Um, the doing orientation will pull me out of savoring and the being and the, and the doing, it's not that that system is bad. It's a dopamine system. Dopamine drives us to do, but the savoring system, the here and now neurochemicals, the H and N's, sometimes they're called, um, which is serotonin, endorphins, endocannabinoids, uh, and oxytocin. Um, Those are the ones that make us feel happy. 
that make us feel calm, that make us feel peaceful, that make us feel um, contented, you know, in, in these moments. And to amplify those, to, to savor and then allow that to sink in and, and even in visualizing it sinking into your brain doesn't take more than 10 seconds or so. Every time you have a positive moment throughout your day is actually going to start rewiring your brain uh, for, for, for happiness instead of anxiety. So a couple of things that come out of this for me, <clears throat> one is the notion of gratitude. In a way, you could frame gratitude as savoring. No you are question. spending yes. time being grateful for the mm -hmm. positive experience that could be called savoring. So gratitude is, yeah, does that make sense? 100%. And, and, and that's another very concrete way to apply what you're describing is after you brush your teeth, write down three things you're grateful for. Like, I, you know, literally like date it. One, I'm grateful for dot, dot, dot. Two, I'm grateful for dot, dot, dot. Every night, right? So after you put your toothbrush in the toothbrush holder, then, this is an after then plan, then I'll write three things I'm grateful for. Um, what if you don't write it? How about, I'm trying you know, to make it simple for people. How about if you just think it or say it or is writing more important because you do more stuff? Uh, it'll, it'll consolidate and sink in better and more, more efficiently. Um, it, it'll, it'll become you more actively mm -hmm. if you write it. Um, it doesn't mean that doing it verbally or in, mentally in your mind won't help. It will. Uh, it might just take longer. Okay, so now a couple of variations on the theme here. First, you reminded me now of there is a scene in a Woody Allen movie. Mm -hmm. And Woody Allen, in the period when he was just 100% neurotic and negative, only expecting the bad to happen. So he explains, I think, to a lady friend his mindset. And I'm really paraphrasing here, but it's something like this. He says... You know, when it's the winter, I'm always afraid I'm going to get the flu and get really sick. When we go to the concert, I'm afraid that somebody's going to sneeze on me. I'm going to get, I'm always afraid that something is going to happen. But sometimes, sometimes I go out and it's a beautiful day. The sky is blue. The sun is shining. That's when I think about cancer. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, you know, I mean, I guess what I'm leading with that is that I believe there may be a phenomenon of instead of savoring or being in gratitude, there could there be a deep feeling because I've experienced, I don't deserve, so I don't, I'm not going to dwell on it because people, I've seen it in movies mostly, but it's like the state that somehow you talk yourself into your state. That's the state that belongs to you is that life is hard, that things are bad. So if something happened, if you dwell on it or savor, in a way you're going against your grain, so to speak, you need to break that. Right. Yeah. It, it, it's, um, Brains crave safety. So, so think of it this way. The reason that your brain does this, and yes, this happens all the time, uh, but the reason brains do this is that brains are primarily concerned with safety, not happiness. It's an unfortunate fact, but our brains care more about safety than happiness. And so what does that mean practically? Like, how does that play out? In many ways, what is familiarity or doing something or feeling something um, that you've felt many times in the past, it's a source of safety or comfort or again, familiarity. Familiarity is in your brain's mind is equal safety. Now this gets really twisted uh, at times. Um, it, it's one of the root causes that people stay in abusive relationships, for example. Not the only, for sure, but, but one of them. Um, uh, somehow the familiarity of oh, knowing you know, what you're getting, even if it's bad, your brain can prefer that to 
trying something new, but you don't know what you're going to get. Um, again, that's where it gets, it gets messed up, right? Um, now, this is bra our brains are doing the best they can. They use the past to predict the future. Brains are ultimately a predictive machine. And so what that means is that, to your point about kind of deservingness, is if you've had lots of experiences in your life in the past that have given you usually social feedback that you're not deserving, that you're unworthy, that you're unlovable, that you're, um, that you're lo that love is contingent. I've got to be something to my parents or else uh, they're going to not approve of me. Um, whether, you know, there's lots of different ways this plays out. Uh, abuse in its various forms is the worst kind of this, uh, what we're talking about. Um, naturally, that template or neural imprint is knit into your brain. Um, brains are socially attuned more than any other, they're more attuned socially than to any other stimuli from their environment. They're attuned to social feedback. And this, of course, this happens from the time we're just teeny. Um, mostly, actually, the biggest imprints uh, from an attachment perspective, among other ways to think about this, are, are, are happening as we're very, very young. Uh, but basically, you know, if we're getting warmth and, and, and love, you know, uh, and specifically unconditional love, like you just belong, in, in our family or whatever your upbringing looked like, um, you're going to believe that you belong everywhere. <laughs> or if you had a feeling of deserving this, me, and this look, what this looks like practically is a parent, again, this is back to these moments for, that matter, right? Moments matter, because that's what life is, is a series of, a string of moments. But that looks like a parent attuning to your inner state. So, when a child gets upset and the parent tries to brush over the upset and says, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. No, 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 don't, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. As opposed to saying, wow, I can see you're really upset. Are you feeling angry? Which is leaning into the discomfort of the, of the negative emotion as opposed to avoiding the discomfort of the negative emotion. What that communicates to the child is my inner world matters, my inner world, which is my subjective experience, my experience of consciousness. I keep getting cues from my, my adults in my world, the big people, the giants in my world, who have lots of power, you know, and, and they're huge and they must know everything, right? Uh, I keep getting messages from them that, that they take me seriously. Mm -hmm. And specifically, like, if I'm feeling pissed, that they're not just going to brush it under the rug. They're going to actually engage with it and try to help me process through that hard negative emotion. That's going to make me feel like I'm deserving in the world. And so I'm going to take that template that I created with my primary caregivers, usually parents, and I'm going to then predict that other relationships are going to follow that same kind of pattern. That's obviously best case scenario, right? But then in the, in the not so good scenarios, uh, if, I, if I've had negative, you know, if they're trying to, you know, brush those negative emotions under the, under the rug and they're, and they're, you know, these are light, these are not abusive situations. These are just kind of like, life is stressful. We don't have time for it kind of situations. Um, I'm going to have some lack of clarity or uncertainty or ambiguity or maybe ambivalence as to whether or not I deserve to, be taken seriously. And what this looks at practically, again, this plays out in lots of different ways. If I'm in a boardroom and, 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 and I feel like I have something really important to say to add to the conversation, I might hold back. Because it never worked when I voiced my, when I voiced in my own house growing up, it always got dismissed. It may not have got like ridiculed, but it was just sort of, okay, anyway, what were we talking about? Kind of feeling, right? So you kind of, uh... Again, we are hitting about something that I, I'm in the financial world as well. I have a, you know, an investment company. And it's very clear that when people finish high school, 
they should have gotten some education about life in the financial world, you know, some, you know, financial wisdom. There should be a course really in high school. Now, when you say those things, I'm visualizing, especially when parents are very young, the parents are running all over the place. They barely sleep. They try to make a living. The, the last thing they're going to think about, consciously at least, is leaning into the feelings of the child. The feeling come as an annoyance. So now you kind of got me thinking, maybe even in high school, there should be some sort of a basic course. Hey, you guys are going to be parents one day. When your parents think about this, what, what you just said, usually nobody has training. The younger the parents are, the more likely their children themselves with lots of needs. But it just occurs to me that just a little bit of information would have helped millions of little children and parents. That one, this is coming from a book called How to, how to, um, how to Talk So Kids Will Listen and Listen So Kids Will Talk. Uh, but the, the research around this is, is Daniel Siegel and others have shown the research around this is rock solid. That one thing, when a child has a negative emotion, you, you identify, you, you facilitate them actually over time identifying themselves. They get good at understanding the nuances between their different emotions. That's a, that's a skilled thing they learn over time. But you lean into it and you identify and you just say, oh, you're really jealous you feel really jealous about what just happened is that right or you're really um angry usually it's like angry and sad you know early on and then they and they get more nuanced as they as they age um and then what happens interestingly is the child's neck because you in in the the research has shown emphatically if you name an emotion it will tame the emotion called name it to tame it so it will if you put a verbal label on the emotion, you actually identify what they're feeling, the volume of that emotion will naturally just turn down by itself. You don't need to brush over it. You just need to identify it. And then when you do that, the child will say, yeah, I'm mad. And then you say something like, yeah, you know what? If he had taken my toy away, I'd probably be mad too. I can understand that. Okay, so I'm gonna play devil's advocate again on this point. If we look at some of the more classically successful people, again, uh, I, successful is extremely subjective. But in this country, being a billionaire is generally considered pretty successful, or if you did something big. If you look at some of the classically successful people in the tech world, let's say, Elon Musk, the late Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, every one of those people clearly has not had a harmonious, beautiful childhood. You can tell they're carrying some pain, they're carrying some scars. And now, now I'm asking you, if somebody grew up all nice and harmonious and they were heard and they feel that they belong, will they have this little, like, you know, the pearl, the pearl grows from the sand, you know, the, the, the friction. Will they have the friction the need to prove themselves. Here, mom, I'm gonna show you that I deserve, dad, you said I was nothing. Here I am, I started a space company. I mean, would those things not be there? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I think the answer is uh, maybe, maybe not. I think success, what drives people to achieve that level of success takes lots of different forms. One form I think is the kind you're describing, which is, coming from a place of deficit, um, lack, right? It, it's the, the motivating drive is to compensate or, uh, you know, achieve something because something was missing earlier on. Um, um, in Maslow's terms, right, this is, it's deficit. Um, um, so, so, uh, I, I, I'll, so, so Scott Barry Kaufman has done quite a bit of work recently on updating Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which I think is really, really important research. He's basically looked at what is, what is the last 20 to 30 years of science shown us post Maslow, you know, in regards to what he's originally proposed as his hierarchy of needs. Um, and 
what he, f they f he finds is that um, those types of need, lack of need, basically needs not being met. Um, no question, those things can, can drive people to, to succeed on those types of traditional markers, like you've said. Um, interestingly, they gen tend to not be satisfied or um, uh, happy. If happiness is one of the goals, which most people would say it is, um, it's, it's, not, it's not satisfying. It's largely because it's dopamine driven. Right. Dopamine, dopamine is a neurochemical that gives you the anticipation of pleasure, but does not give you pleasure. Doesn't give you happiness, peace, calm. The, the here and now chemical, neurochemicals are the ones that do that. And then so, the addiction so, cycle too. I mean, that's, that's, you know, the power and the money or the drugs, they're all an addictive surge of dopamine, but it's not going to give you something s stable, right? Yeah, it, it, it will give you, it will, it will make you feel like a good feeling, like happiness is right around the corner, but it will always be right around the corner. You stay around the corner. <laughs> dopamine is a driver. It motivates us to do things. So it's important. It's critical in our overall wellness. If you don't have good high enough levels of dopamine, you'll be depressed. You won't get out of bed in the morning. So it matters in a, in a neural cocktail of, of, of a balanced brain. But um, it, um, there are other things that drive people to succeed also additionally at that exact same level. And, and one of, some of the most powerful ones are, are emotions like curiosity um, or mastery. You know, um, mastery is one of these things that balances here and now chemicals, the H and N's, the happiness chemicals with dopamine in a very beautiful way where you get deep satisfaction over gaining mastery over a particular domain. And it's very driven. You're very much achieving in that mode, but it's also simultaneously incredibly satisfying. We, we tend to get the deepest forms of satisfaction from the things that are the most difficult to achieve, like writing a dissertation for a PhD or something, right? My brother just finished his PhD. That's why it's on my brain. And I must still remember the phone call I had with him the, after he defended and, 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 they, and they, they approved it. And he, the words were like, I have never done something that hard. And at the same time, it, it, like, I, like I, I, I got to the finish line. I did it in the surge of, of satisfaction, of, 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 of deep, um, you know, uh, pride, you know, in a job well done. That, that's, that's the kind of meaning, when you talk about meaning, what makes a meaningful life? So, you know, James, uh, that's what creates meaning is pursuit of difficult things that generally speaking, contribute something to the broader world. They're not just about you. They're actually also about others. Yeah. And also, you know, it persists. It, it's not like the satisfaction of the moment. Something has been done, which persists. But, you know, I feel like we are only getting warmed up. We could be here for five hours and get deeper and deeper and more fun and more fun. However, I do want to take it out into the realm of we have viewers of this podcast and I want them to be able to benefit from your clearly vast reservoir of resources and tools. So on your website, I've seen certain modules that people can uh, sign up and learn uh, to be productive by design, habits by design, happy by design, new skills and capabilities as as a superpower, really, can you talk about this and what people can do to get some, to, you know, to take the next step? So, so yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, so I, I offer a course every six weeks um, and it is the combination of those three things, happiness, the science of happiness, the science of habits and habit formation and the science of productivity. Um, it's, uh, it's for sure the most intensive and I, I think best value of, of the things I offer. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a six week intensive course, basically understanding science help instead of self help. <laughs> um, and, uh, and all the latest behavioral and neuroscience, what it, what it will tell you about each of these topics, right? How do self motivate, like self motivation is a, what they've discovered is a learnable skill. Uh, and it looks very different than what you would learn at a personal development or self-help program on a, on a particular weekend. You might go to, a, looks different than that. Um, 
habit formation, right? Learning how to really master this process of building positive habits in your life and allowing those to become defaults that just run and hum in the background of your life, whether those are health promoting habits or happiness promoting habits. Um, mastering that skill set is something that you'll get, you know, you'll get better at. And then getting your head around the science of, 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 of happiness, again, not just from a like, oh, I get what this is, but in a like, oh, I've changed my brain in some fundamental way that makes me by default a happier person. So that's what I'm really after with the courses. And, and um, yeah, it's brainbydesign.com. Um, you can learn more about this. So wait, when you say, again, I'm getting a little bit more practical here, six-week course, what does it mean? Six weeks every day, six weeks once a so, week? Yeah, so there's, it's, a, it's a mixed model. So there's um, portions of the course that are on demand and there's portions of the course that are live. We'll gather, I just did it right before this, um, uh, once a week. So the live portions are once a week for those six weeks uh, and then the on-demand sessions. Um, basically, so let's just take habits. So you'll, you'll go through sessions one and two on demand on your own time, go through the video modules, you go through the exercises, et cetera. And then you'll come to the live session on habits with a group of other people and ask questions and have a facilitated discussion about how you're applying that science of habits in your own life. So, so getting more granular, getting more concrete, you know, looking at um, specific scenarios and, and really understanding how it really applies in your life. That's what we're generally doing in the live sessions. Is there a, um, reading material that you recommend um i will be probably not wrong if i say that you must be working on a book i mean is there something we can read um yeah i i've got i've got a book in my uh sort of long-term range goals but but i'm not actively working on it right now um but but in terms of places to go so, so part of the course actually is there's a curated reading list for every single um, session. So it's, it's very much like, like read this one chapter in this one book. Good, good, uh, good. Uh, for, for, for if you want to just get your head around this particular topic. Right. Um, so, so in that way, um, I've really tried to make it, I've tried to read hundreds of books, so you only have to read 10 right. kind of a thing. Um, and even 10 chapters, you know, after, yeah. But yeah, yeah, yeah. And mostly I've tried to distill it actually in the presentation and in the actual learning and not, we won't have to do the reading. That's not, it's more supplementary, but, but that's right. That's right. So you said before uh, you gave us one very, very specific thing to do. You said, pick a time where that you do something every day, like brushing your teeth. And then right after you do that, write three things that you're grateful for. That's the savoring. That's the gratitude. Is there are there one or two more things that people can take away straight just from listening to us here like that? Um, yes. Um, so if you're trying to build behaviors or build habits, that what, what you're describing, Adil, is um, they're called if-then plans. Um, and basically, this is how you program your mind or your brain. You set it up as an if-then plan. So if blank, then blank. If, um, you know, uh, my, uh, you know, if I, if you're trying to create a, be a better listener, which is a hard habit to create, it's a hard um, thing to, uh, because it's more ambiguous about what that means. If I have something I want to say in a conversation, then I'll ask one question instead. That would be like an example of an if then plan, right? Or if I have something to say, if I want, if I want to say something, then I will, um, you know, uh, um, count to ten before I say it. Uh, these are ways to concretize the behavior and turn it into like a basically a program. It's almost using for those who know computer science, you'll sense that that's kind of almost like computer language. Yeah. Um, but you can change that to an after then plan as well. So after I put my toothbrush in the toothbrush holder, then I will write three things I'm grateful for. Um, after my feet hit the floor in the morning, then I will go for my morning jog. 
after I blank, then I'll blank after I open the fridge, then I will eat one carrot stick. This would be an example of a mini habit. Um, but so that, yeah, that, that would be behavior change wise. Uh, if then plans are gold, they'll, 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 they'll almost triple your likelihood of doing the behavior versus just having good intentions. So the, the, the using an if then plan is not like, um, oh, it's a nice idea. It's like, oh no, you're, you're almost three times as likely to actually follow through if you put it in that form um, is what the research has shown. So that, that's probably my biggest recommendation in terms of concrete tools. Um, there's lots of others, but um, I, I think the biggest takeaway for listeners is to understand that all brains, including yours, has within it massive amounts of dormant potential. And, and so accessing that potential and actually activating that potential is absolutely 100% in your power to do. And so getting good at these types of things isn't like, um, it's not like, oh yeah, I'm just like learning stuff, that's cool. It's like, no, I can radically change my life and my brain by getting good at this stuff. And, and I, I, I do believe it's sort of the, um, I don't know, I think it's sort of the emerging kind of critical skill set of the 21st century. I think this would have been a great way to finish here, but I do have a nagging question again. We talked about almost making it a code, like, you know, a like a computer code, if then, or, you know, after then, and that is great, but I'm going to call it in a crude word, I'm going to call it laziness. I was talking to a friend recently, we're talking about they have a yoga practice that's very short, just 15 minutes of yoga stretches, makes them feel amazing, mm. very healthy, very good. Told me, listen, in the last month, I don't know what's going on. When it comes time to do it, and I do it before I eat, I'm just too lazy. I don't feel like I want to, I don't feel like it. So mm -hmm. you can have a program saying, if then, okay, now it comes the then time. So mm. I'm sorry, I'm lazy. Or the television, because again, you have very, very powerful things are flashing in our face all, all the time, mm -hmm. wanting to give us all kinds of stimuli, the television that show that. And so that you can be very lazy and yet very engaged in this kind of stuff. But to do that yoga practice or the stretching or the lifting, or, you do need to exercise some lack of laziness, if I call it that way. How do those, yeah. Yeah, you want to, you want to give yourself a non-option. Uh, basically, you want to set it up so, I call this the forced detour. So if you've ever been on the freeway and you have a bunch of barricades across the freeway and they actually make you get off the exit, mm -hmm. this is what we would be describing here. Uh, and, and that analogy of our brains being like highways and dirt roads and freeways is quite apt because brains are a complex interconnected system of neural pathways. So so if you're trying to build a new neural pathway, what you're trying to do is get off a neural freeway, which may be checking your phone all the time, that's the strong one, and you're having to force it to do the yoga. You're, you're making it get off the exit uh, to do the yoga. Brains won't do that if, not, if given the choice. Another way of saying that is, uh, they call this the law of least effort. If your brain has a choice, it'll always choose the easier option. All right because any brains are energy scrooges. They like to conserve energy. So they're not, it's not that, so lazy is one way to say it. Um, it's, it's more on the pejorative side. I, I like the term energy efficient. They're, they're really energy efficient. They don't wanna spend energy because they're concerned with safety. Safety, in order to get out of harm's way, what you need is a lot of energy. So the point is brains uh, are like energy scrooges. They have plenty of it, just don't like to spend it. And so what you have to do is find ways to get around that problem by setting up decisions. You have to make a, you have to build the decision into the environment, like having someone like a workout buddy, or, or if it's yoga, having someone who you do the yoga with, maybe it's even virtually over zoom or something that every day at 7 PM or every day at whatever time, you do it with them. Now that's going to make your brain not want to disappoint that person. We're so socially sensitive 
that you're gonna actually get off the exit even though it's annoying and you don't feel like doing yoga today, right? Because you're in, you've, you've bound yourself up with another person with that behavior and in that way, you're essentially forcing yourself to do it every day and, and that's hard in the beginning, but over time, once it becomes a habit, it becomes easier and easier and easier. That is fantastic. So, you know, James, um, I really truly feel like we are, we're just getting warmed up. This is fascinating and useful and wonderful. And I, for one, am certainly going to check the six week course, because again, you know, every time I do an interview, I say, this is even more fundamental. This is even more basic. So, you know, you talk about exercising, you talk about lifting weight, you talk about what we eat, how to, okay, fine. But then we had a series of interviews about breathing. I said, what could be more fundamental breathing? Well, what are we talking about? Thoughts in our brain. That's, <laughs> you can't get more fundamental than that. You don't need any money. It just happens. And if you change it, even one, one little, uh, you know, iota, you can change your life. So it's like we're going ever more on the finer, you know, existing. And you don't, we don't need to do, so, to do much of what you said. We don't need to spend and buy weights or go to a gym. Or, it's right here. I mean, it's amazing. So we will spend and go to the gym and travel and this. Here we, we can do a couple of things here, which radically changes life. Yeah, that's great. Well, that's fascinating. And thank you so much for shining a light on this. This is, this is really good. I really thank you for being so generous with your time and information, James. Yeah, you bet. You bet. And if, any, if anybody is interested in taking the course, if you use the, there's a coupon, co a coupon code and it's fearless, fearless. If you use the coupon code fearless, it'll take a hundred bucks off. All right. Cool. Thank you so much, James. It was a real pleasure to have you with us. Yeah, you bet. Thank you, Adia. Thank you for joining me today for the second part of our amazing interview. If you didn't catch part one, don't miss out. The link is in the description below for you. And be sure to click the subscribe button for more videos.